In our last session, we spoke about food. We spent quite some time talking about food. It is a very important aspect. It influences our mind and our body quite uh, immediately. And therefore, food is a very important aspect, a very basic aspect that one needs to work with when we want to go into deeper meditation. Irrespective of whether one is an Atikari or one is very diligently working towards building a good foundation. As I mentioned in the very, very first session that we have had, not everyone is an Adhikari. An Adhikari is one who is qualified for all parts. There are basically three kinds of practitioners, seekers. First is those who have a very mild interest. They are not qualified for all parts. They are basically qualified to create a good foundation, work on lifestyle, and perhaps they can, if they wish, be given some simple practices. Very often, these persons are more inclined towards rituals, external practices. <clears throat> the second kind of seeker is one that has a medium intensity of desire and such a student can do a little bit more, can be given other practices, maybe some of them internal, maybe some external, mixed. The third kind is a student who has very intense desire and this kind of student is often given internal practices. Such a student is willing to give up everything in order to stay on the path and to go deeper into practice. The Adhikari is the one who is basically qualified for all paths. That is, he has very intense desire and is qualified for all paths. We are talking about the different aspects of lifestyle, how we can work with these, and these are, are important for all categories of seekers whether they may have mild interest, medium interest, or very intense desire for attainment. We first spoke about sexuality, after which we spoke about food in great detail, and now we speak about sleep. Since we cannot interfere too much into this natural process of sleep, we have to regulate, to regulate this desire, primitive urge, is quite difficult. I have encountered people who are doing some practices, but they believe that with Whatever they do, very often they are just some kind of asanas. And sometimes they do some kind of awareness meditation, breath awareness meditation. And with that, they believe that they will manage with just a couple of hours of sleep. This may sound ridiculous to some of you. But it really happens more often than we can imagine. 
that there are such misguided seekers who are suffering from major sleep deficit. Some of these people keep drinking coffee and energy drinks to stave off sleep. And this causes an extreme disturbance in the sleep pattern. It can also cause serious damage to mental, physical health. To interfere with the sleep pattern is dangerous. Often I have been asked, what is good quality sleep? Everybody needs good quality sleep. And good quality sleep means that there is no real disturbance during sleep. For instance, a sick person, somebody who is physically sick, will not necessarily have very good quality sleep and therefore may need even more sleep. Emotional disturbance also means poor quality sleep. If you're extremely stressed or emotionally disturbed, such sleep is also very disturbed and it's not good quality. If you have a lot of noise and light pollution, this also causes disturbances in the sleep pattern. Most of us need two to three hours of deep sleep and five to six hours of dream time. Now there's a lot of misunderstanding about the nature of sleep. So first, let me clarify that. There are sleep cycles. During the course of one night, that is eight to nine hours, you may have between three to five sleep cycles in which you go through from the waking state to dreaming state eventually to deep sleep, you come up again to dreaming and maybe touch upon the waking state but, but just very shortly and then go back into dreaming and then again deep sleep and this cycle continues between three to five times. <clears throat> to understand this cycle a little bit better, I will put the other diagram that we use very often and that's the diagram that most of you are very familiar with. This is the yogic anatomy. <clears throat> we have the body and the senses here and the breath this is the conscious mind. So this part is the mortal self. Then we have a part that is partially immortal or you can say partially mortal. And this is made up of the active mind and the latent unconscious mind. Both are unconscious and most of the time we know very little about this part of ourselves. In other words, we are, if I can use this phrase, um, like split. We are split into two parts. We have this conscious part and we have this unconscious part. Deeper is, of course, the center of consciousness. But staying with the idea of waking. This is the waking state here. We are aware, for example, right now that we have a body with the, our senses. At this moment, you are listening and watching what we are discussing here. You're breathing. You're aware of that now, now that I've mentioned it. And you doing all this with your conscious mind. Your conscious mind is like an interface. It's like the screen of your mobile or the screen of your laptop. And with that, you are 
communicating with the world around you. The second part, which is so split and cut off, is the unconscious mind. And most of us go to bed every night for eight to nine hours or, or seven to nine hours. We sleep and we do not know what happened during that time. We have no idea what transpired. Most of us don't remember our dreams. Most of us, almost all of us, are not aware that we have a part in our mind that is known as latent unconscious and this is deep sleep. So what happens every night? You go to bed. From this waking state, your awareness moves to here. This is the dreaming state. Eventually to the deep sleep state. It moves back to the dreaming state. It may touch lightly upon the waking state, but just briefly, and then go back into the dreaming state. Again, to the deep sleep state. It goes back to dreaming, back to latent, and these cycles happen three to five times in a night. So this is how sleep looks. From a yogic perspective, it is a very beautiful process if one is aware of it. If one is not aware of it, then it's like being a split person. You have this waking life which you lead and then you go to bed every night for almost one third of your life and you don't know what happened there. Any questions so far about this, this diagram or in general about the anatomy of sleep? Question is, what is the role of Yoga Nidra in this? Yoga Nidra is a, is a practice, is a technique. And Yoga Nidra is also a state. In the state of Yoga Nidra, you would be here and you would be alert. The practice of Yoga Nidra tries to take you there. Unfortunately, what most people don't know is that Yoga Nidra is an extremely advanced state. Most of the times, merely practicing a technique will not get you to this state. It requires years of systematic practice. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then I will go back to our earlier section here, where we were, and that is this part where we were talking about the need for two to three hours of deep sleep and five to six hours of dream time. Now, poor defic sleep deficiency leads to poor concentration, depression, anxiety, loss of memory, impaired learning ability, and a host of other problems that then emerge out of these. It, it really is extremely important. With, because of lack of sleep, you could accelerate aging, it impairs judgment, it causes accidents. Serious sleep deprivation is also connected with, with increase in appetite, resulting in obesity and many, many other 
problems which then will emerge out of these initial issues. So we see how important sleep is. If you just think about it, think about sexuality, we think about food and we think about sleep. We know that there are people, there are monks and nuns who have led lives of celibacy. So it seems that sexuality one can live without. Food, on the other hand, also we have heard of hermits, recluses, monks who fast for, for weeks, even a couple of months, and they can manage even with a complete fast for four to six weeks. They can live, but beyond that not. The body becomes too weak. But sleep is so essential that if you try to keep awake the entire night, and if you don't get your two to three hours of deep sleep, you will start hallucinating. So extreme sleep deprivation can make one deranged, mentally deranged. Since you, since Beth brought up the question of yoga nidra, I would like to say that I've had many people ask me about yoga nidra and I must admit that it sometimes bothers me because a lot of people skip everything. They are not doing systematic practice. They don't have a teacher. They buy books or CDs or, or whatever, and then they practice this, and they assume that because they are doing such a technique that they do not need to sleep more than two or three hours. Unfortunately, as I just explained, the technique is different from the state. Practicing a technique does not necessarily mean that you will go to that state. And even if you should get a glimpse of that state, it may be momentary. To suffice with only two to three hours of sleep, you need to be an adept who has a direct and conscious access to his unconscious mind and therefore requires no more dream time. So I hope that explains that yoga nidra, the technique when practiced, is, can be even dangerous if one doesn't understand this distinction. Um, Shibu, I missed that question. I, did, I just saw it. Deep sleep and meditation are almost the same. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. I'm assuming that you are referring to this diagram where I said that um, in yoga nidra you are here but you are conscious and if that's what you meant then if you are conscious you are not in deep sleep you are in the state but you're not in deep sleep that means you're not unconscious sometimes we stumble upon the words and for those who have not had that experience, you're trying to understand something that you have never, ever experienced. It's like trying to explain to the natives of the deep rainforest what an iPhone is. And it's almost impossible. So... If you are conscious when you are in the state of deep sleep or in the latent unconscious mind, 
then that is yoga nidra which by the way is the same as samadhi I must admit that, that we are getting kind of in that part where I say this is a little bit intellectual, a little bit theoretical and not necessarily useful. Beth, I don't know what you mean by brain states, so uh, if you want to clarify, then I might be able to help. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So happy to um, Yeah, no, I was, um, I think I meant to say brain wave states, and I think it harkens back to Swamiji's research at the manager clinic. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm just curious in the context um, from your perspective. Yeah, that was a um, scientific perspective, and of course, we are looking at it from a yogic perspective perspective here. So when scientists um, hook you up or hook up a person to biofeedback uh, equipment, they try to read something from the external sense, you know, from, from the outside. And then they read that in terms of brain waves. So they, through the study of your brain waves, they know that if there are delta waves, they know that you're in the state of deep sleep. But you were referring to that experiment where Swamiji, even though he was in the state here, that the scientists knew he was in deep sleep, he still was aware of what was happening around him. And he could repeat what the people around him said. Which for a scientist is totally unacceptable because if you are in deep sleep how can you be conscious it seems paradoxical right and so of course um, when we start talking about the, this question about yoga nidra <laughs> it's I stumble upon words because it is always um, hard to explain something that's purely experiential and if the other person has not shared that experience, then it's almost like talking at, you know, cross purposes. So I'm going to go back to the more practical aspect. So we see how, how important this particular primitive fountain is. We have also noticed a little connection between food and sleep, and that is that excessive food causes dullness, drowsiness, and perhaps too little food as well. So it is very clear that these four primitive fountains are deeply connected, and we will, of course, go into the, the relationship of these four as well. One serious issue that needs to be addressed is that of modern lifestyle. That with our modern lifestyle, maintaining regular sleep patterns is seeming to become really a great challenge. We have a very strong influence of mobile technology, internet, television, all of these which um, with, with the kind of blue light which it emits, the screens, really disturb the mind. It has been shown that it's very hard for people to calm down, to quieten down, to sleep when we have been consuming media just before. Things like surfing in the internet, watching videos on YouTube, watching Netflix or continuously checking our mobiles, sometimes even in the middle of the night. Getting up in the middle of the night and um, 
looking at our WhatsApp messages. Now, this is causing people to get too little sleep or disturbed sleep. And modern lifestyle, which encourages very long working hours. In fact, if you don't work very long, you're completely unimportant and really an irrelevant <laughs> person, which is very tragic. It doesn't seem right that we glorify sleep deficiency. What happens is that when we sleep far too little at some point of time, which is generally the weekend, you collapse and you try to compensate for that sleep deficit. This doesn't really help. What this leads to is irregular sleep pattern, sleeping patterns and mood swings. Mood swings and kind of swings between hyperactivity and sloth. This is extremely harmful for the body as well as for the mind. So I cannot really um, explain how important sleep is. It's really probably one of the most important things today for people to know that we need to get our sleep. For most people, seven to eight hours of good quality sleep is sufficient. For most people, there are exceptions, infants and sometimes newborns need up to, you know, 17 to 18 hours of sleep. Adolescents need a lot of sleep. Those who are aging, sick, pregnant women, these also tend to need more sleep. If you sleep too long, you might feel very dull. And heavy and experience sloth. And if you sleep too little, you get irritable, impatient, and snappy. So you see that there's a need to manage the time we sleep and the quality that we sleep. So about the age of 40 years, you may find yourself sleeping less or sleeping lightly. This is also something that you must remember. This may seem like a very simplistic bit of, of advice here, but it is really important, sometimes really good to take very short naps during the day, especially for those who work a lot or who are extremely stressed. 15 to 20 minutes, that's what your body needs, your mind needs to just relax. You don't really sleep, you just rest. This will make you more creative and fresh for the rest of the day. And one should not nap for more than 20 minutes. So a nap means resting, it is not sleeping. It means you don't go to the brink of sleep, you come back before that. You can think of it as a a little bit of time for the body and mind to just relax and love the thoughts, allow the mind to play, if I can put it that way. Any questions so far? Okay. So it's not easy, but it's important to work out a good bedtime ritual. A good bedtime ritual is not only good for babies or children, it's even good for adults. It really helps you wind down. Going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time, and not using 
that time for watching television or surfing on the internet because this continuous movement of images disturbs the mind. So it's best to, to have a little bit of discipline there and say, mm -hmm, we will not watch television or surf on the internet at least for an hour before bedtime. I also recommend that you put away your mobile phone or put it on airplane mode before bedtime. Turn off all devices and even better, do not keep any devices in your bedroom. Create the right atmosphere for sleeping. Try to have a room that's darkened, which is quiet and has no noise as far as possible. So you can choose a bedtime ritual that suits the mind. Some people like to enjoy a relaxed stroll before bedtime, practice meditation, read from a, a book that calms and suits the mind. I would not recommend a, a crime <laughs> story before bedtime, but books that are strengthen positive thoughts. What you can also do is definitely avoid coffee, black tea and green tea after 2 p.m since these also tend to remain in the system and disturb the sleeping patterns. Instead, you can drink herbal teas without sugar, have fresh lime drinks with honey, or just, just have plain hot water. Avoid eating heavy dinner or indulging in after-dinner snacking. So these are all very popular aspects of modern lifestyle and um, having gone through almost all of them of course it might seem like I'm a bit of a you know killjoy a spoiled sport um, but these are very important aspects of lifestyle Of course, you can enjoy your evening out once in a while, but it's, it's important to also have some discipline to balance out one's life. So the points to remember, go to bed at the same time every day, wake up at the same time every day, get seven to eight hours quality sleep, have a dark and quiet bedroom, Air out the room regularly. Avoid keeping devices in your bedroom. Do not drink coffee, black tea and green tea after 2 p.m. And do not eat heavy meals in the evening. Avoid after dinner snacking. So, these are some of the aspects that are important part of lifestyle. Any questions about sleep so far? Okay, in that case, we go to self-preservation. Self-preservation is really a difficult topic. Oh, sorry. No one wants to talk about death. It's not our favorite topic. Yet, the fear of death is so deeply ingrained in us that in the early parts of our life you completely suppress it, nobody wants to think about it, but as one ages this fear becomes stronger and stronger. So self-preservation manifests in the fear of aging, fear of losing the loved ones, 
fear of losing worldly possessions such as your job, your house. Now, fear is not merely about physical death. Fear also comes from the death of a self-identity, a false self-identity. For example, if you have the self-image of being young and healthy for the rest of your life, this self-image starts falling apart when you discover your first grey hair. A lot of men have this idea that they can park very well, the car, you know, park good, they're good at parking, while women are not. So that's a myth, of course. But a man would feel attacked if somebody questioned his ability to park a car. His manhood would be under attack. So while you might find that idea quite amusing right now, for a person, for a male who is very strongly identified with his car and his driving ability, this would be a very serious attack on a self-identity. These kind of attacks are just like physical death. It's, it's probably even more painful than physical death. Because natural death is in fact like falling asleep. And this is why sleep is called Sahodara, the little sister of death. We saw that already in this diagram. We saw this that <clears throat> at night, when we go inward, when we are here in the deep sleep and in dream state, we are completely unaware of our body. You don't know that you have a body or not. This is what death is like. It's like going to sleep. You lose body awareness. And that is why death is called, sleep, sorry, is called the little sister of death. That's why a natural death is not painful. Any questions about this? About sleep and death? If you die of unnatural causes, you may experience pain physically, but the process of this separation is not physically painful. We will go into this process of separation. And that is here. And I don't know quite why, but the diagram is not very, uh, not very clear. That is the case. I need to enlarge it a little bit, so maybe it's a little bit better. So the diagram is the same as the earlier one. The only difference is that this has fallen away. So, senses in the body, the breath, conscious mind, and the active unconscious mind has fallen away. And this is death. What you're left with is the latent unconscious mind, which has all the seeds, the desires, the seeds together with a center of consciousness. And it is this part 
that is reborn. It's this part here, the mortal part that drops away. And that is why death is only separation. It's just that this part drops away and when you're reborn, it sort of grows out of this, grows out of these seeds. Any question about death is separation? So what happens is that when somebody dies, when a very old person dies, one says, hmm, you don't have to feel sad about it. This person led a very f fulfilling life. But on the other hand, when somebody dies young, you say, oh, it is so tragic because he had so much to live for and so much to do in life. That what did he have to do? It is those things which were in the unconscious mind that needed to come forward. So these desires that are there, they remain. If they are not manifested in this lifetime, they will have to manifest in another lifetime. When you live your life and you live out your desires and your samskaras, at some point the body gets tired. And you, who is you? You are the center of consciousness. You have associated with the Nashwar. What is Nashwar? Nashwar is all that which is perishable. And you have forgotten that you have attached yourself to the perishable. You do not remember that you are pure consciousness and that you're not going to die, that you will come back again and enjoy this plane of existence again as long as you have the desire. So every time you go through the same process of separation and every time you experience that pain of separation and after innumerable times of experiencing this pain, it becomes deeply etched in your ancient memories. And so then the fear of death or separation is a vasana, it's a diffused memory of deep fear mixed with numb pain. You don't remember all these separations. You only remember what was the result of that. This fear, this this diffuse kind of fear of the unknown and this has been learned over innumerable lifetimes it can be unlearned not death but the fear of death can be unlearned as in death as in separation separation we want to overcome that by attaining self-realization if that happens, we do not have to die again and again. You become the eternal, pure consciousness. You identify with that. You are that. So when you know that eternal nature, true direct experience, you are not, you don't die.
and you know through direct experience that you are eternal, so you become fearless. So how can one regulate this? It is the most difficult of all the primitive fountains. We mostly we completely suppress the fear of death. The idea of growing old itself you completely suppress. So we need to approach this fountain or this primitive urge with respect. You could take up one of the following exercises. Make a list of all your fears, such as a list of fear of loneliness, fear of aging. This is not an easy exercise. You can make your last will and testament. This always makes you think about things that you don't really want to think about. You can contemplate on what you would do with your life if you were to die in a year. The reason I have mentioned a year is that a lot of people find it extremely uncomfortable to think about dying in six months or three months. One year somehow seems to be a little bit far away and so the mind can deal with it. You can do something every day that gets you out of your comfort zone, like talking to a stranger or asking someone to do you a favor. How is that connected to the fear of death? Not directly, but it will help make you more courageous. Cur courage is not just about soldiers going to war, facing death. Courage is also required in our daily life. In small things, we find ourselves shy, embarrassed, awkward about things, and we have to overcome these things, and that also requires courage. So this is how we can work with this very, very difficult fountain or very, very difficult primitive urge. Any question regarding self-preservation? Stewards asks, why do we do those to begin to approach the subject, face it? I'm not sure what the question means, Stuart. It's not um, very clear. Hello? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, yeah, just... Do we do we do we kind of begin those exercises because kind of the fear of death is something that you don't want to think about? So it would be you, you start to kind of touch go towards that a little bit by doing those exercises to kind of bring it into your consciousness or that's that's the question really. Yeah, you mean the exercise as in these ones about fear and loneliness yes. and yeah. Yes. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, because yeah. it's a very touchy topic, and uh, it's. Um, I, can you mute yourself again, Stuart? Because now I think it tends to echo. Yeah, it tends to echo when we both are uh, speaking. So yes, fear of death is the deepest of all primitive urges. It's also called a klesha. 
I know that you're a bit familiar with the Yoga Sutras, and you may be familiar with the term Kleshas. These are colorings, or just another word for samskara. And the fear of death is the deepest, is extremely powerful. And what I have seen mostly with people when we start talking about this topic, most people do not want to approach this at all. Best thing is just run away. <laughs> so it's also, it can be violent to oneself when you force yourself to do this because hankara, which is a self-identity, feels very threatened. And so you, you have a conflict. On one hand, you want to develop you want to begin to slowly look at these things, but on the other hand, you don't want to push yourself too hard to be so violent that the mind will compensate. What is compensation then? The mind will shut down. That's what the mind will do when you push it too far, too quick. And so to avoid that, Always, always, always in meditation, we always deal with deeper issues, very touchy issues, with great deal of care and gentleness. Pushing certain issues too hard will result in a kind of backlash where you will then just, the mind will just shut down. So that's why we do these exercises sort of trying to you know not not take this on you know not going head on but trying to so go kind of the back you know through the back door and do this in a more gentle way if you notice that partly the exercises are starting with the more difficult ones and then they get easier so if you think that making a list of your fears is hard, for some people it is because the fears are so completely suppressed that they don't even want to deal with them, then of course it's pointless trying to force yourself to, to make a kind of a list which becomes an intellectual exercise. Making your last will and testament, that somehow approaches it a little bit more practically because... I think at some point or the other, everybody has to deal with that. Contemplating on what you would do with your life now is, if you were to die in one year, is a very interesting thought experiment because it will make you more aware of why you are on this plane, why you are here, why have you taken this body. And that's a very important exercise. For all of you, if you haven't done it, then contemplate on this. And the last one is actually for those who really have a very tough time with the idea of death. Um, then just drop it <laughs> and just do things which get you a little bit out of your comfort zone. It's very similar to approaching that because that completely pulls you out of your comfort zone. So these are some of the things that one can do. Yeah. So, we have five minutes and I think that we can just go through the connection, the, the relationship between these four. It's important to regulate these primitive urges in a way that you don't, um, you know, dom you don't have one which is dominating your life completely. There, there needs to be some balance. So if there is one or the other that's dominating your life, for example, food, it can lead to Obesity, if you just indulge in food all the time, which is, which can drastically shorten your lifespan. 
So you need to do something about it immediately. It is just like you have, if you are, have a, a drug addiction, you have to stop. And that is called Tiaga or abstinence. You have to stop. There is no way out. There's no way of doing this gently. So while we recommend that one regulates all four of these gently, there may be a time if one of these urges has dominates your life, you need to get back in charge. And in that case, you may have to do tiaga. You may have to take severe measures. Otherwise, we can regulate them gently. Excessive indulgence in sexual desires, for example, is harmful physically as well as mentally. Mental hygiene is very important for us and those of who are aware of the ill effects of um, sexual indulgence or even pornography, for example, a passive consumption, uh, mental hygiene is seriously compromised. But throughout the world, there has been a long tradition of celibacy in spiritual religious traditions. Celibacy is, of, is tiaga. It's nothing other than tiaga. But celibacy or tiaga too is very restrictive and can be counterproductive if the person has not developed mentally and spiritually. Therefore, it is only appropriate for those who have grown out of a strong physical need and strong mental desire for se sexual satisfaction. A life of moderation is always recommended. Now, whether it is with sexual desires or with food. You can enjoy sweets and chocolates or ice creams or whatever else, but without forming a harmful habit. Sometimes you may notice that even if you are regulating these primitive urges, still the mind tends to remain preoccupied with thoughts of sex, food, sleep, or self-preservation. So this shows us that, that there is a direct connection also to the emotional level. So merely regulating these at the physical level, in the physical world, is also not sufficient. At some point of time, we may need to deal with them at a mental-emotional level. What has also been observed is that with age, the hold of most of the primitive urges diminish. You will need less food, less sleep, and sexual desire is also not as strong. There are, therefore, those people who believe that the practice of advanced pranayama and dhyana is easier with age. But this is not true. A strong foundation is required. Because otherwise, with increasing age, you will have find it very difficult to unlearn deep-rooted habits. How, how shall you sit for meditation if you have not done that before? And of course, as you age, of course, the primitive urge of self-preservation really gets active as well. So while the others may decrease or attenuate, the fourth one starts getting active. So you may have noticed that there is always a tendency for compensation. One is active and the others are kind of mild. When suddenly another one of them gets active, then the others are milder. So they are interconnected. So if you just very strictly manage one, the others will, will get active to compensate. So it's like...
you are not going to get it right. You're not going to always get it right to have all four of them perfectly balanced. So where does that leave us? We find that most of the time self-preservation is so deeply buried that we are unable to, acquire, to get a handle on it. Sleep is hard to really observe because we lose our awareness. Sex is connected with social taboos and strong emotions, so that's also difficult to observe and regulate initially. So that leaves us with food. And so it is not without a reason that so much emphasis has been put on food and lifestyle, food-related uh, habits in the yoga scriptures, in Ayurveda. And that is why you see that um, how all four are interrelated. Now, as you become more aware of these things, hopefully after these sessions you will be far more aware of these things and how they are related and connected to each other. With awareness, you will find that it's easier to adopt some form of discipline. The greater the awareness, the easier it is to manage the primitive urges. Any questions so far? So this was then our last session on Adhikara and on lifestyle, creating a good foundation. Um, I don't know for sure what subject uh, we should um, take up next Friday. One of the subjects that I had initially suggested was the Yoga Sutras. If there are any suggestions, you can write to me. If you have any other ideas, you can, you can write me. And uh, otherwise, um, I will let you know on, uh, on, this, um, on Facebook in the, in the satsang group. Yeah, um, Manisha, where to get the PDF? Uh, the PDF, um, well, I have not... Put it up, but I will put it up um, on the website under downloads, so it will be available there. I think, um, well, not on the weekend, <laughs> next week sometime. So yes, it, it it will be there shortly. Okay, right, so I'll see you then. Next Friday, I don't know what the topic is, but we will find out very soon. And have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Yep. Yep. Bye, Shibu. Bye, Anisha. Bye, Das.